All these people are currently living through the most technologically advanced era since yesterday. Today everyone's obsessed with gadgetry and machines that light up and go pippy pippy pap pap pip. We spend more time gazing at luminous screens than into the eyes of our loved ones. Gadgetry has become so commonplace we consider it part of nature itself. Which is more technologically advanced, an iPhone or a cat? Definitely a cat. That's a ridiculous answer. But recently, machinery has become so advanced, it's downright terrifying. How did we get this messed up? Maybe things started going wrong when we first surrendered our attention to this flickering meddler. This week, how TV ruined your life simply by being part of human progress. Don't say it didn't, it did. Progress. Where would we be without progress? Well, you wouldn't be sitting there watching this for one thing. No, you'd be standing outside in a smock like a peasant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we'd all be outside amusing ourselves by playing the duck bummer phone like these gormless serfs. Not that we'd have time to engage in such lofty pursuits. Oh, no. Without, say, modern machinery, we'd be far too busy chopping wood or tilling the fields. Have you ever tried tilling a field? It's no fun. Mankind's hatred of chores like field tilling has led it to create all manner of devices to make life seem less pointless and disgusting. From the camel wheel to the wooden foot-operated bow thing to the portable smart arse, they're all world-altering technologies. World. Once upon a time, television was a new technology itself, and of course, like all new technologies, it was inherently mistrusted. After all, the television was an unfamiliar intruder which squatted in the corner of the living room, demanding the entire family shut up and stare at it. If any of these people could have torn their eyes away, they'd have thought it was sinister. As you might expect, this dangerous new invention had a vested interest in making out technology was a beautiful thing, and it quickly set about showing us wondrous visions of the world of tomorrow. Optimistic programmes like Tomorrow's World gleefully coughed up new and bizarre visions of a glittering future full of automated dialer drink pubs, cuddly death machines, jet-powered hoverloos, chessboard skin transplants and sleek futuristic magic cars which would let middle-aged men impress swinging hot panted dolly birds with their accessibility and extreme comfort. <laughs> And, of course, this future was peopled by plenty of clockwork slaves. Introducing Mabel, the robot housemaid. The common assumption was that we'd become a nation of robot-owning layabouts who delegated all our domestic tasks to some sort of motorised Jeeves. Even the ostensibly enjoyable stuff, like taking Rover for a walk, was farmed out to the bot. Looks like an episode of Britain's Strongest Dog. Some of the most popular early TV serials, such as the whizzy, forward-looking Tom Corbett Space Cadet, celebrated man's harnessing of technology. Scarcely a moment went by without audiences being startled by some entertainingly probing deep space expedition. General Smith, will you order one of your military space crews to investigate Uranus? <laughs> he said Uranus. How does Uranus look, Husky? <laughs> he said Uranus. Uranus is not uninhabited. <laughs> he said Uranus. The computers show that these radio waves are coming from Uranus. <laughs> oh, they're going to keep saying Uranus, aren't they? Of course, the march of progress was lent an extra friss on by the very real space race between Russia and the USA, and as we hobbled towards our giant leap, TV was keen to lob all manner of spacey imagery at the viewer. As Neil Armstrong and his buddies prepared to cram inside a big tin dick and blast off into history, Tomorrow's World showed us what the moon base of tomorrow would look like and how it would work. There'll be a daily shuttle service where 300 passengers at a time will reach Moon City after a five-day journey from Earth. Liars. While Blue Peter turned into a protracted NASA press briefing with wide-eyed items detailing virtually every aspect of space travel. Well, possibly the first man on the moon will be an American. And it's nice to think that we've helped him on his way with our specially made British cooling suit. Whatever the space age heralded, it was clear mankind was going to have a great time of it. Space was going to be all ours. We'd own that shit like an empire. Then the night itself arrived, billions around the world huddled in front of their televisions. And then thrillingly, while a global audience of billions watched with bated breath, man set foot on the moon. But what is that? First man on the moon, eh? 
For a while, space exploration was groovier than ever, celebrated in shows like the fast-paced alien-busting thriller UFO, which showed wee freaky far-out humanoids conquering an endless wave of extraterrestrial vandals hurtling toward the planet like annoying metal wasps. But away from the televised fiction, we kept returning to the moon in reality. And what did we discover? Well, we discovered that space exploration was a letdown. For one thing, there wasn't much to do on the moon. There wasn't even a Nando's. We'd spent billions sending astronauts there just to piss around. I was strolling on the moon one day In a merry, merry month of December now, May And furthermore, when you stood on the moon and looked back at Earth, our planet now looked worryingly fragile. Having mounted a lengthy PR campaign in its honour, TV now started to wonder whether progress was such a good thing after all. The totally unforeseen accident on the lunar surface has caused very serious repercussions here on Earth. Hence the likes of Space 1999, a depressing vision of a future not worth bothering with in which the moon had become an industrial waste dump, manned by accident-prone space lackeys so incompetent they caused a massive nuclear accident which sent the entire meaningless chalky bauble spinning off into deep space with a bunch of angry-looking middle-aged people in unflattering lycra stuck to it. And as the years slid by, things remained resolutely grim up tomorrow with shows like Blake 7, a grit-toothed, we're-all-gonna-die space opera from Dalek creator Terry Nation. This was an epic tale of political exiles perpetually on the run from the evil Federation. It was a miserable existence. Uh, space itself was a washed out dystopia of brown and grey hexagons where the highlight of your day was finding a war memorial in a quarry. Some sort of obelisk, I suppose. The crew were constantly being shot at and shaken around like despised stepkids each time the Liberator hit a cosmic pothole. It didn't even have a happy ending. The entire cast were gunned down in a final episode so devoid of hope it seemed to have been filmed on a camera made of frozen widow's tears. But dying was probably a sweet relief really since during their brief lives they'd been continually tortured by the technology that was supposedly assisting them. The chief source of their torment was Aurak, a whirring, winking, smart ass in a box who loved himself almost, but not quite, as much as an iPhone, and who treated his human companions with the haughty condescension of a professor of Latin snorting at an especially stupid peg. Aurak, I want to tap Central Spacecraft Registry. Can you do that? Tap? What is that? Obtain information from the records. It's a bit like watching people struggle with a beta version of Windows Vista 30 years ahead of its time. You will clear the receptor circuits to receive an emergency program. Confirm when ready. Confirm readiness. Come on, come on. You know, sometimes it was like watching Jeremy Paxman wearily quizzing Michael Howard on Newsnight forever. That information is not immediately available. Well, can you get it? It has no bearing on the problem. Can you get it? Eventually. How long is eventually? It will require time and resources, far in excess of the value of the information. Well, get it anyway. I want the reason for that alert. Very well. I will report in due course. Jesus, even Apple computers aren't this snooty. Aurak was cold, heartless and relentlessly disparaging. Can't help thinking if a computer like that was around today, it wouldn't be in deep space. It'd be judging a talent contest. Once upon a time, computers were so unwieldy and complex, merely switching one on required an army of dweebs acting like they were operating a nuclear submarine. OK, please, have the keys are in. Right, keys in. Can you check this oil level, please, Harry? Oil OK. 
Right, can you check disc temperatures, please, Malcolm? OK, disc up to speed. Hello, alternator house. Disc oil and temperature OK. Is it OK your end? OK for standby. Switch on standby, Peter. Standby coming on. OK, HD coming on. The computer is ready for use. But by the early 1980s, computers had become so compact and so basic, it only required an army of one schoolboy nerd to operate them. This is the computer, and what we're going to do is just to go through a simple little program to demonstrate the computer's capabilities. Microchips were cheaper and more plentiful, prompting a wave of exciting ads about intelligent machines that could patrol your home. Program in up to 16 commands, and Big Track will advance, turn, and fire three blasts. Man was clearly getting more comfortable around his machine helpers, sometimes suspiciously close, as in the silly high-tech fantasy Knight Rider, in which pube-head hunk and future one-man irony empire David Hasselhoff repeatedly slid inside his softly spoken friend Kit to share flirtatious banter. They were such close buddies, it wasn't so much a will-they-won't-they they, as a where's he gonna stick it. Not now, Michael, I have a headache. You know, you never acted this way before, pal. I guess so. I've never felt this way before. Perhaps the most intimate relationship between man and computer occurred during Auto Man, a ghastly concoction clearly inspired by the movie Tron. It starred Desi Arnaz Jr. as Walter, a geeky backroom cop who somehow manages to create a digital friend called Auto Man who can easily leap out of the computer world and into ours. Although Auto Man was presumably designed as meaningless tea time fun, the whole thing seems like a massive gay parable. This could be viewed as the tale of a closeted fantasist who creates a dashing alter ego in order to express his repressed leanings. Because it looks to me like Walter massively fancies Auto Man. I mean, look, he feels electricity when their hands meet. Put your hand on top of mine. Then he leaps at the chance to get more intimately acquainted with his silicon chum. Come, enter my dimension. You're kidding. I'm not programmed to kid. Move into my form. But once Walter plucks up the courage to fully penetrate Auto Man, he has a sort of breakdown and becomes a split personality. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. I I'm you. You can never be me. Still you. After which this futuristic schizosexual goes cruising through the city streets at night, picking up men. Naughty boy. <gasps> Don't hurt me. I may just want to break you in half. Jesus Christ, Auto Man. Just let me bend him a little. No, we have work to do. By now, real people were inviting real computers into their real homes. As far as telly was concerned, computers were supposed to be for important stuff like spreadsheets and numbers and more spreadsheets and more numbers. But it soon became apparent they were being off-roaded into extracurricular fun activities which challenged the broadcasters for space on the box itself, as enthusiastic early commercials made clear. Now you can play the world's most popular arcade game in your own home. What's more, they were so advanced they offered an entertainment experience far beyond just gawping at things. In television Tron, it's so involving, you'll feel as if you're actually in the movie. Really? Before long, a whole range of new entertainment options was available and Trad TV clearly didn't approve. There's monster games like this one, where you run around bumping off critters or swallowing giant cherries. And there's the Space Invader theme, where you shoot at moving fleets of hostile aliens. Fairly boring. And then there's the more recent sports games. Well, sports games to me are perhaps the most appalling use of computers. Ever since, TV has routinely portrayed video games as an inherently unhealthy and otherworldly threat which glorifies violence and is probably bad for your noggin. Children in primary and secondary schools are being spirited away to an obsessive world of habitual fantasy violence. Perhaps the most in-depth, not to mention pre-flipping posturous exploration of the menace of computerised video games was Linda LaPlante's Killer Net, a searing 1998 Channel 4 drama exposing the horrendous truth about computerised entertainment. It concerned a floppy head student milk toast called Scott who got obsessed with a bizarre stalking and murdering game which wasn't technically feasible then and still isn't now. To succeed in this frightening game Scott had to carefully select a willing victim she is Tracy painstakingly learn how to stalk her and spy on her as she's undressing all without leaving evidence. Shit. Footprint. Your score is too low to continue. Oh. 
Hmm. As well as being difficult, the impossibly detailed game is also magically addictive, and before long, Scott becomes totally obsessed with plotting his cyber killing. And inevitably, because games are sick and wrong, he kills her with a hammer. <laughs> Yeah, not exactly Sonic the Hedgehog, is it? I've killed your victim and gained access to stage three. 